Okay, um, I'll start my uh, presentation on um, introduction to named entity recognition. All right, so um, I'll start with some uh, motivation of why we, do we want to do named entity recognition. So um, through the Arches 4 and Creed's projects, we have collected uh, hundreds of thousands of public gene expression samples and signatures um, from public repositories. Um, so we also have pipeline to uh, retrieve and also reprocessing those data sets. Um, however, the metadata uh, from the public data sets are not um, um, very easy to be structured. Um, so it's um, not easy to annotate those samples and signatures we have because they are mostly uh, in the formats of uh, unstructured uh, free text or um, uh, some of them have some structure. So here's the, uh, just an example of a geo data set where you have a summary free text, title free text, and organism, maybe that's structured human uh, and then uh, also overall design, uh, those are also free tags. And for each individual samples, um, there are some uh, structured um, uh, key value pairs to describe those samples, but also there are the free tags. So um, what we wish to do is to um, develop an algorithm to automatically uh, parse the free tags associated with those data sets and samples so that we can uh, identify the biological or bi biomedical entities um, uh, in those free texts. And we care about genes, uh, cell types, tissue types, uh, cell lines, uh, disease name, and drugs or chemicals. Yeah, so um, what we can do is to use uh, named entity recognition, uh, which is uh, uh, a task under a broader uh, field of uh, natural language processing um, which has to do with um, um, programming computers to process and analyze uh, large amounts of natural uh, language data. So um, here um, I list a few uh, natural language processing tasks or NLP tasks. So um, it can be broadly uh, categorized into um, maybe from easier to more difficult ones. Um, first, we have uh, text annotation tasks. So um, and there are also different types. Um, for example, we can uh, classify an entire document um, into uh, different categories using classification. So for example, we can do a sentiment analysis uh, where the input is a document and the output is, for example, that's a, if that is a review on Yelp. We can classify that into a five star, four star, or down to one star. Also, um, um, for example, the email spam detection is also a text classification task where you classify text or emails into spams or non-spams. And another task for text, uh, text annotation is classify the individual word, uh, word tokens within uh, the document. So um, one uh, particular um, task for that is part of speech tagging. And I will go into more details uh, in one of the later um, step of the presentation. And another thing is uh, identifying phrases in the natural language, which is um, what we're uh, the major topic of the presentation, uh, named entity recognition. And also, we can do a syntactic annotation to annotate a sentence uh, to parse it into uh, different structures of the se sentences, such as uh, subject, object, and you know the verb uh, between them. And uh, so these are the text annotation tasks. And also uh, NLP has other more interesting and advanced tasks, for example, generating new text. Um, and what we can do is to generate new text from audio, and that is uh, the speech recognition task. And also we can generate text from uh, other languages, uh, for example, that is um, 
and centrally machine translation, um, giving one language as input, and you get um, output of the translation in another language. Um, also, um, we can um, do uh, single document or multi-document summarization tasks to uh, compress longer documents into um, shorter and more concise um, sentences to uh, summarize um, the overall um, content of the long document. And also, as I just showed before, we can um, do this auto-captions from image, um, that is to translate image into shorter text. And also, there are even more uh, advanced um, tasks that's closer to this uh, artificial intelligence. For example, uh, one task is um, machine comprehension, uh, which um, is to um, ask the com computer a question after it reads a uh, piece of documents. That's kind of like a reading comprehension, but for a computer algorithm. And there is, uh, I found actually a very interesting Kaggle competition where um, the competition is to um, have the algorithm to read through uh, whatever you can find on Wikipedia and then uh, answer uh, uh, questions from a typical US 8th grade science curriculum, like multiple choice questions. So that um, also requires maybe a deeper understanding of the um, documents that your algorithm reads and being able to um, answer a particular question um, related to those documents. And also other um, advanced tasks include um, um, programming a chatbot or Twitter bot where you um, learn to um, chat with real human and also learn to reply there to uh, retweet or uh, whatever you call it on Twitter. Um, okay, so um, we'll start with the basic um, um, name entity recognition. So uh, name entity recognition is this NLP task that seeks to locate or classify named entity in a predefined uh, document uh, in a um, from a predefined document and into those categories. And um, so these named entities may include uh, those common categories, for example, the name of a person, um, name of a location or geograph um, cities, uh, countries, and names of organizations, and also uh, other types of names that are summarized in this table. Um, so if we... Um, look into the problem of named entity uh, recognition, uh, there are actually two steps. So the first step is to do the segmentation of the um, sentences into uh, tokens of words. And some, um, many entities are multi-word uh, entities. So you will need to be able to learn how to, where to draw the boundary of the um, um, word tokens to um, find this named entity. And the next task after you find this named uh, entity is to classify what type of named entity it is, whether it is a person, a location, organization, or something else. Um, so it's also um, not trivial to do the uh, named entity um, recognition um, because of the complexity and sometimes the ambiguity um, in the natural language. So here I listed a few examples. Uh, for example, the first one, a study from University of California, Calma Berkeley. So um, I think the correct um, MER for this is the entire University of California, Calma Berkeley, rather than University of California. And maybe also um, you can tag the Berkeley as a geolocation and this entire uh, UC Berkeley as a um, organization. And also um, another example is that uh, Google rebrands its business apps 
So here, Google can be tagged as a uh, organization. However, in this next sentence, um, it says, uh, let me Google this for you. So here, Google is not an organization to use that sort of word. Um, yeah, some other examples here. Um, Beijing, Washington moves closer to trade war. Here, um, Beijing and Washington are not geographical locations, but rather uh, two countries um, used in this case. Um, yeah, also um, here I just paste a random, uh, randomly found uh, geo uh, studies description and I tagged a few. Um, um, so for example, this one is a protein's name and that's the uh, name of a um, drug or chemicals. And as you can see, it gets even more complicated when you have those um, um, a lot of uh, acronyms. And also, um, sometimes uh, the researchers write the same thing, uh, even with the concentration added to them. So it's pretty difficult. Um, for an algorithm to tag that into the same entity. Yeah. Um, so uh, general approaches um, for NER uh, can be classified into two types. The first type is very basic uh, linguistic uh, grammar-based or rule-based techniques. So basically what you do is to um, um, just tag the um, just analyze the um, um, linguistic structure of a sentence, and usually named entities are uh, nouns and or subjects or objects. So you define some kind of uh, rules based on grammars, and then tag those. Uh, so that's uh, obviously um, not as sophisticated, and I'll demonstrate the um, performance of these types of approaches. And um, another types of approach is uh, statistical models. So there are um, um, conditional random fields models, as well as deep learning based approaches to perform uh, named entity recognition. And I'll also uh, get into more details um, when we have, um, um, after I introduce the data we want to work with. Um, so the data specifically is um, based on um, human annotation of um, um, 798 uh, PubMed abstracts. So um, in this data set, they annotated uh, over 6,000 uh, disease mentions across those many uh, documents. And it's also a pretty uh, high quality data set. They used 14 human annotators and also two annotators per document uh, that are randomly paired to uh, ensure the uh, correctness of the annotations. And they um, annotated the disease um, mentioned in the uh, PubMed abstracts into those four specific categories, which are uh, specific disease, uh, disease class, uh, composite mentions of multiple diseases, for example, here, uh, prostate, uh, pancreas, pancreas uh, skin, and lung cancer, as well as uh, disease that are used as a modifier uh, rather than a noun phrase. For example, uh, here in this example, uh, hereditary uh, breast cancer families. So here, breast cancer is used like a uh, adjective. Um, and next, I'll uh, perform some experiments um, on uh, different NER algorithms uh, for this data uh, we're interested in. Um, so first, I'll start with a synonym dictionary and some rule-based approach. Um, so here I have another notebook um, which specifically implement those uh, easier and uh, less sophisticated approach for performing NERs. Uh, all right, so I can run that first in four libraries, and then I load this data. So another good thing about this data set is that they have already divided the data into the training and test set. 
so we can um, um, train our model on the training set and um, get an independent uh, performance measure on the test data set. So here is what the data looked like. Um, so I'm only looking at uh, the first uh, document from the training data set. So here, as you can see, that's the actual abstract of this uh, PubMed articles. And here, um, these are the annotated entities. Uh, for each entity, it has the uh, start index and end index of where this entity is, and the class or the label for this entity. So for example, that's a disease class start from 15 to 26, which is from here, skin tumor. Um, so uh, the first thing we want to do uh, before actual uh, doing the um, NER is to do word tokenization. So word tokenization is the process of uh, breaking, um, breaking down um, the continuous, continuous running text into individual uh, word tokens. So there are different uh, ways of doing that. Um, one straightforward and easy approach is to just uh, split by the white space between the words. So um, I think I, I actually have another um, presentation two years ago during lab meeting, which is doing the text classification. And I have some um, very brief introduction for word tokenizations. So, um, yeah, so tokenization um, is just breaking down the um, sentences into words, but it's not a, a trivial problem when you can uh, consider many um, special cases. For example, <clears throat> um, you have uh, Finland's capital, like how do you break down the uh, apostrophe S here, and also phrases like, uh, what are and um, isn't, uh, do you treat them as one or two? And also uh, phrases like sort of the art, is that one word or four words? And also um, phrases like New York, uh, maybe that's more of a entity recognition problem. You can consider them as, uh, you can uh, recognize them using an ER. And also um, phrases like PhD. Yeah, so um, English is um, difficult to tokenize, but there are even more difficult languages. For example, <laughs> um, France, uh, French. So you have uh, phrases like uh, ensemble or ensemble, they actually mean the same thing. And I think last time <laughs> I asked Alex to pronounce these words. <laughs> Yeah, All right. Um, yeah, I think that's it for uh, word tokenization. Um, right, I think maybe I didn't get it. Right, so to actually do the word tokenization, uh, those simple approaches, including maybe just uh, the most straightforward and uh, simple uh, way is to just split by uh, white spaces using a uh, regular expression. And also, um, there are some other more advanced um, tokenization algorithm uh, that can be uh, learned from um, um, different uh, pre-trained language models. For example, this tree bank uh, word tokenizer uh, can maybe get a better result. For example, here, and can be uh, tokenized better. Um, all right, but for this purpose, I will just use a uh, simple white space um, word tokenizer. And here is the result after tokenizing this um, paragraph. Um, so the next step after uh, tokenization is to do the part of speech tagging. Um, which essentially is labeling the sentence um, into text uh, like adjective, non, uh, preposition, verb, verb, and etc. So there is also an implementation for that in the uh, NLTK package in Python. Uh, really 
So this is um, the results after um, doing this pause tagging um, for the first sentence. So here, um, it label each word uh, with the um, uh, part of speech text. For example, DT here means uh, determiner, uh, common years. JJ is adjective, um, and skin, FW, foreign word for some reason. <laughs> skin is a foreign word, and tumor, um, and then um, it's not. So yeah, so that's just the second step um, of doing um, uh, this simple rule-based NER. When you have these um, uh, POS tag, you can do some um, learning with that, and also maybe define some rules to um, identify the named entities. Um, so next, uh, I will just do the POS tagging for the entire training and test data sets. That takes time. Um, so um, the first um, simplest and maybe most straightforward way to um, do the NER is to just build a large dictionary of synonyms. And what you do is to just create a dictionary to store every um, named entity you see in the training set and then um, apply that into the test set to um, just kind of get a baseline um, evaluation of how good this um, very basic approach works. So here I implement this um, just to get a dictionary and go through all the documents and um, all the tokens um, in the training set and then uh, label them with the entity type. So here I have a counter um, indicating the most frequent um, synonyms or in the dictionary. So here, for example, I have tumors as disease class that appears 53 times. Um, so we can also, um, so next we will make predictions just based on this dictionary. And then what I did here is to go through um, the test set and then uh, do the dictionary lookup for each tokens in the text uh, test set. So if the token is uh, in my dictionary, I just predict that token to be um, the entity I see in my dictionary. And then I can uh, evaluate how good this um, synonym based approach is doing by um, evaluating it using the F1 score, which is the um, average um, the um, harmonic average of um, precision and recalls. Um, so here, there's a function to calculate this uh, F1 score. So I get an F1 score of 0.369, which is not pretty good, um, but still um, it's better than um, nothing. Um, so also there's a way to evaluate for these individual class um, uh, to look at the breakdown of the position and recalls and the F1 scores for them um, before taking the average. Um, so as you can see here, for a specific disease, um, it gets the best performance compared to um, the other two. So I guess um, maybe the conclusion you can draw here is that um, specific uh, the terms or named entities used to uh, describe a specific disease is more unique compared to disease classes or uh, uh, modifiers. Um, so another approach um, for uh, NER is to um, uh, define some rules. So um, these rules are based on the POS tags. So here um, I'll just uh, uh, extract some features from the tokens uh, uh, from actually the token uh, annotated with the POR, uh, POS tags. Here uh, I have this large function for extracting uh, the features and the features include uh, the word itself and uh, the lowercase form of that and whether that is a digit 
or is it uh, uppercase or lowercase as well as so here I'm looking at the last two or last three uh, letters within the words to um, get the suffix of the words and also um, I looked at uh, the words before and after the words um, to also get uh, some of the similar features so that I also can uh, have an idea of the uh, actual context of the word within the sentence. Um, so then I use these functions to do the feature extractions for the training set and uh, test set. And then um, I can perform this rule-based NERs. So um, here I just arbitrarily define two um, very simple rules. The first rule is just to predict any words with the POS tag of NN, which is uh, nuns, uh, to be a specific disease. And any other ones will be uh, irrelevant. And another rule too is to just um, define any words with the post tag uh, name uh, NN, uh, followed by oh, following a determiner. Uh, or other types of um, POS tag words, for example, adjective, nouns, and pr uh, predict them to be a specific disease. So that might slightly more um, elaborate compared to rule one, uh, but we'll see how they perform. So here um, is the um, evaluation of rule one. So as you can see, I get an average F1 score of uh, 0.02 is pretty bad. Um, yeah, also, um, well, here I'm only predicting this specific disease class, so maybe 0 0.06 is the performance for that. And so that's rule one, only tagging all the um, nuns to be <coughs> a specific disease. So that's kind of like more baseline um, approach. And here, um, rule two, it's even worse. I get a 0 0.03 uh, for the F1 score. Um, but certainly, um, you can define more uh, sophisticated uh, rules and also including more uh, knowledge from the grammars into it. Maybe you can uh, improve that. But uh, still, the performance of these types of approach for an ER is pretty bad. Um, all right, so next, um, I think we went through uh, the ling linguistic uh, grammar-based and rule-based techniques for the NER. Um, there are also these statistical approach. So one of the popular approach is this uh, conditional uh, random fields or CRF models. So um, here is, I find this figure is very uh, intuitive in explaining what uh, CRF is. So um, you can imagine a logistic regression model uh, where you have multiple features to trying to predict, trying to classify uh, whether this instance is or is not uh, a certain uh, class. So what um, CRF does is that is to um, uh, extend this concept of logistic regression to sequences. So what you have is uh, the features um, for each element in a sequence. And then uh, you are also aware of the ordering of these uh, elements in this sequence. So then you can uh, use uh, these features extracted from all of these elements as well as adding the information from the surroundings to predict um, the class labels for each of these uh, elements in the sequence. Um, so this is similar to hidden Markov model, uh, but the difference is that hidden, <coughs> hidden Markov model is uh, directed, whereas uh, CRF is non-directed, so you can go both ways. So here um, is... Um, in implementation of the CRF model uh, on our training set. <clears throat> so the training is pretty fast. And also, uh, 
the parameters I used are pretty much the default from the tutorial. But the performance improvement compared to um, the um, basic baseline approaches from the rule-based or synonym-based is pretty huge. So the F1 score is 0.51 on the test set uh, compared to maybe point, uh, let's see how much is the synonym. Yeah, 0.36 from the only using the synonyms. So um, also uh, we can do a breakdown for the individual. Um, yeah, so next, uh, I think uh, experimentation with a, a deep learning approach. Um, so I found a package called uh, Spacey. Um, that is a Python package for natural language processing using uh, neural networks. So um, it has uh, many of these pre-trained models on just corpus of uh, English text. So here, um, what I did is just to load one of these pre-trained models and then just run this NER on my data. So it has this pretty nice um, visualization uh, function. So you can just run uh, render uh, to visualize the results from the um, NERs. So without uh, any training on this on this NCPI's uh, PubMed data, it can um, do the NERs for some of these, um, but not really correctly. Maybe only correctly for these uh, cardinal and this percentage. And these uh, were labeled as organizations. And also, um, I won't go into, maybe I'll come back to these, uh, how it works later. So what I did was to just train a spacey model from scratch. So what you can do with this package is to initialize a blank English model, and then um, create a pipeline that is going to do the NER. And then um, you can fit your own data into this uh, NER training pipeline. And then, uh, so here is my training. Um, I iteratively train uh, this data 20 times, like 20 epochs, to um, have this model see the entire training data 20 times. And then, um, so these are printing out the logs, and as well as the F1 score on both training and validation. So after that, I can save the model uh, using this to this function. And here I'm just plotting uh, the improvements of the F1 score over the training epochs. So uh, the blue one is uh, the F1 score from the training set. So I get to a point of uh, 0.95 at uh, the 20th round of the training. And the validation seems to uh, plateau I think maybe around uh, seven or eight epochs. So that means um, there might be a little bit uh, overfit of the model. Um, but still, um, uh, we can see the F1 score on the validation set is close to it's actually 0.76, which is much better than the CRF model. So after I run this, um, load load this uh, trained data after the 20 epochs of training um, and compute the F1 scores on these three sets. So training 0.95. And then um, I can run this uh, in the ERs on a training data points. And as you can see, uh, these seems to be tagged pretty correctly. And I can display the truth. And I think that's be 100% correct for this particular example. And also I can uh, just find a random example on the test set. And so that's what the model think uh, these uh, named entities are. And also uh, I can display the truth for this uh, particular uh, test examples. There are some differences. For example, this uh, Copper toxicosis should be a modifier, and it's not tagged here. Um, 
but in general, uh, they look pretty similar. And also from the F score, we see uh, that's a 0.76 um, average precision and recall. And also we can get more into the details of how um, this NER is doing the predictions by um, uh, asking how confident this model is at uh, tagging each entities to output a probability for each entity's entity type and where this entity is. So um, here's a function. Um, yeah, so here I define a function of getting this probability and then apply this um, entity scores, apply this function to get this uh, probability output for this particular test examples. And we can see on the top, those are the pretty confident ones, although there might be uh, um, some mistakes. For example, this off copper toxic is tagged as a modifier. Apparently that is wrong. Also, another thing you can see here, uh, there's a probability of 0.5 and 0.4 for this uh, wounds and disease. So it's not quite sure whether it's a specific disease or a composite mention. So um, um, for these type of examples, where um, there's a general way to improve uh, the models, um, that is through uh, active learning. So the idea of active learning is to have the model present the um, predictions or samples that is uncertain, which is maybe the probability around 0.5, to a uh, human annotator. And then the human uh, will tell the uh, correct results to the machine. And then the machine uh, relearn these new examples to further improve uh, its um, probability. So that I mean the performance. So that's like the general idea of the um, active learning. So um, I think that pretty much concludes um, the presentation on uh, NERs. So the general idea is to have these uh, NER models uh, trained on these annotated data sets. And then we can apply that to all the um, studies on GEO and then um, for those um, predictions that the model is unsure, uh, we can present those models to human. And then that will uh, uh, further improve the model and also uh, reduce the uh, workload of human having to annotate all of these texts. So that's, uh, yeah, that's most of it.